Hello everybody. So in this lecture we're going to talk about the family in sexuality, the next topic on, on our course. And the way that's organized here is pretty much in these three sections on the family, sexuality and family partnering. I will first uh, in this specific lecture here talk only about the first topic, giving you a brief historical review of the family and talk about some major trends and levels of indicators related to marriage and family nowadays. And then in the next lecture we're going to talk about sexuality and family partnering. So uh, the family is one of the most important foundations and agents of socialization because it is the first place that we learn culture, norms, values and gender roles. So uh, usually uh, actually is within families that where fertility happens, exactly like the production of children. And so for demographers, it's really important to understand family because the way that societies are organized, the way that people organize into families will be an important um, topic in relation to fertility levels and the fertility patterns of a specific country. So that's why family is important and also family, that's where we also learn about health habits and then we have the education of parents and all these aspects also influence not only fertility but also mortality and even our migration uh, patterns in the future. So family, uh, the family constitution varies across cultures over time. It's not a stable way that families have been organized. It, they vary uh, between countries, but they also vary within countries over time. The Western world traditionally regarded uh, a family as constituting of a husband, uh, a wife and children. And, but nowadays we have been seeing an increasing number of one-parent families, families that have only the father or only the mother living in the household. We also have been seeing increase of gay and lesbian families, blended families as well, and also families without any children. And the descent system, it varies between countries. So in the U.S., both the families, both the ascendants of fathers and mothers is important, so it's a bilineal descendant system. And in China, for example, it's more patrilineal. The information about the family of the father is more important within this descendant system in China than in the U.S. So just to give you a, a brief uh, historical review, of how families uh, have been organized. Polygyny was banned around the 12th century and extended families declined in number. So families started to be more at, at nuclear families instead of extended families. And up, around, up to around the 17th century, marriage they were usually uh, mainly related to gain ancestral legitimacy established military, political, commercial, and economic alliances. So this is really typical, for example, in European countries when, for example, uh, exactly to establish some military and political alliances, the, um, the kingdoms of Portugal and Spain, for example, they would uh, arrange marriages between their families in order to um, establish all these different military and political and commercial and economic alliances as well. So by the end of the 18th century in, the Western, in Western Europe, the love match became normative when people started to establish their families. So the husband started being the one providing for the family in terms of working outside of the household and bringing resources to, to the house and the wife uh, focused more on the family life. But one interesting thing that the textbook 
uh, of our course emphasizes is that in the U.S. during the colonial era, there were no sharply divided roles of the husband and the wife. All of them, the husband, wife, and children, all work together mainly in agricultural uh, activities uh, in order to provide resources to the family. So there was not this clear divide between husbands working outside the household and wives working in household activities. But in the U.S. during the colonial area, everybody in the household worked together in order to provide resources to the family. Um, so in this shift from extended to nuclear families uh, happened as pretty much like all these major societal and structural changes in Europe and in the U.S. And that move from extended family to nuclear families happened in connection with the industrialization process that these countries were experiencing, the urbanization, also an increase in economic productivity and changes in the market economy and individualization. So uh, the, the societies became much more industrialized, produced, produced in a um, larger scale and also people moving from rural to urban areas, everything started to be more expensive in terms of providing education to children, in, in terms of getting uh, resources to the household. Although productivity increased, the new market economy kind of uh, increased the, the, the um, amount of money, amount of resources that you need to bring to, this, to, to the household and to increase uh, and to actually provide enough resources to children and good education, and that all increases individualization in those societies. So exactly related to urbanization is pretty much people moving from rural to urban areas, so there is a rural-urban migration, and more adults are working in factories and, and in other non-familial -fa settings. So people stop working only in agriculture, in agricultural activities within their own land and then they start working in factories and in other places not related specifically to uh, to places in, in which their family is on. And uh, so the control in decision making moved from extended families to nuclear families and this decision making became less based on familial connections. So all the decision making in, in these societies started being more related to your work, um, your work goals, education goals, both of parents and children. And that's how you started to think about the future of those families and the connections in terms of getting good jobs or getting good education. It's much more related to your job is much more related to uh, this market economy, which you lose a little bit of the influence of family connections. And in the US, this is a nice graph from Steve Ruggles in this paper from 2015. The reference is at the end of this lecture. Uh, in this paper, he shows how the organization of the families that was like pretty much 90% back in 1800 was formed by corporate families. And corporate families is pretty much those families living in, in, in small agricultural um, activities, like they had a small land and all members of that family were working agricultural activities, as I mentioned before. And that was pretty much the majority of the families in the US. And you see that they were still a high percentage, around 50%, even around 1910. And then after that, you start to have an increase of families in which the husband is the one working outside of the household and bringing resources to the family. So now families have much more this male breadwinner in which he's working outside, bringing resources to the family, and the woman starts to do more the, the activities uh, within the household. So this uh, kind of family starts to be, uh, increase the percentage in the country in the early 1900s, 
But then what we see in the late 1900s and now in the 2000s, it's a huge increase on the dual earner families in which both the father and the mother, they worked outside of the household, bringing resources, bringing food, bringing earnings, bringing money into the household to uh, provide to the family, both to, to, to the parents and, and to the children. So that's exactly around like in the second half of the 1900s that we see an increase in proportion of the dual earner families. And you also see around that time an increase in families in which the woman is the male, is the main person uh, bringing resources to the family. Women, uh, the, the, the wives, um, working outside of the household, but also some families in which uh, women are the, the only, the mothers are the only one present in the household without any father present. So the household is pretty much, uh, the resources are brought by, by women. By, so that's pretty much a female breadwinner uh, composition of this family is also increased. But you see that nowadays, most of the families, they have dual warner, a dual warner characteristic of both father and mother bringing resources to the house. So some demographic changes have been experienced in the U.S. in these last uh, in these last decades, in these last years. So here, as you see, we are like focusing more on these family changes, specifically on the U.S. And three main topics we can uh, highlight in terms of demographic changes: uh, it's related to life expectancy at birth, age when women have uh, the last child and also marriage and childbearing no longer are defining events on people's lives. So let's just talk a little bit about each one of these three topics. In terms of life expectancy at birth, it increased a lot in the U.S. in these last centuries. So people used to live only around 74 uh, years uh, in their life. They used to live only 74 years on average in the 19th century, and now it increased to 83 years on average, uh, based on data from 2012. So there is a huge increase in life expectancy at birth, which means that there were a decline, is a decline in mortality rates or improvements in health. Or improvements in health, uh, health resources, health services, health habits, and declines in mortality make uh, they contribute to an increase in life expectancy at birth throughout this period. In terms of the age when women have the last child, what we see is that the age when a woman would have her last child does not greatly impact uh, her anymore like it did in the 19th century. Women in the 19th century, they, uh, on average, they had only 14 years of life remaining after they, they have raised their last child to age 15. So after the last child uh, reached the age 15, on average, women, they would have only 14 years of life remaining in the 19th century in the U.S., kind of showing that they didn't have um, much life after they, they had to provide and they had to uh, spend a lot of their time and, and resources to children. But nowadays, women, they have 33 years on average of life remaining by the time that they have raised their last child to age 15. So this time more than double from 14 to 33, kind of showing that now they have much more time to uh, enjoy their life, to do all different kind of activities after they raise their last, their last child to, to age 15. So that's another huge change that happens in the U.S. exactly because now you have a decline in fertility rates. So by the time that the children re, uh, reach age 15, women still have a long time in their life. So it's pretty much a, a connection between lower fertility, having less children, and also mortality because women now, they live longer. 
And in terms of marriage and childbearing, they are no longer defining events and activities of our lives. In earlier times, they were our identity. Pretty much getting married and having children were important aspects of someone's life. Today, they are less of a central part of our lives. And I just want to go a little bit more in depth of like all these changes that have been going on in terms of marriage and childbearing by looking at some trends of marriage and family today that and, and we are going to focus more on on the US so we're gonna like just show here uh, these five main topics within these changes in marriage and family in the US so the first of first one how old are people today when they married for the first time? How many people get married? How many people cohabit before marriage? Fourth, how many babies are born to unmarried women? And what are the trends of interracial marriage in the U.S. nowadays? So I'm going to go through these five topics one by one in these next slides. So the first one, age at first marriage. Males, at, uh, they usually are, they were 26 years old, and women, they were 22 years old at the end of the 19th century when they first got married. So on average, in the 19th century, men, they used to uh, be 26 years old when they first got married. And women, they were younger and a little younger than 26, and, but on average, 22. And by 1960s, uh, males, they were 22.8 years on average at the time that they first got married, and women 20.3. So you saw actually a decline in the age of men getting married from the 19th century to 1960, from 26 to 22, and for women from 22 to 20. And this decline is actually related to the growth of well-paid jobs under industrialization. So when you have this good economic environment going on in, in the country, people tend to marry earlier than they were marrying before, and also they tend to have more children. So they marry earlier, and they also start to having children earlier. So um, that's why we see this decline, which is related to the economic situation of the country at that time. And after that, after the 60s, you actually have an increase in age at first marriage. So since the 1960s. So nowadays, more in more recent years, in 2014, men on average, they were 29 years old when they first got married and women 27 years old. So just to see these trends in a graph format, that's what we have here, data from 1890 until 2014 you see that the age at first marriage uh, fell from men from around 26 to around 22.5, uh, and then it started to increase again uh, to men. And for women, you also see the same trend. It declined. It didn't decline so pronounced as, as it did for men, but it declined as well, and then it started to increase. So you see these uh, changes in... In the overall averages of uh, at age at, the, at first marriage of declining and going up. And another thing that you also see here is the differential uh, between by sex. So you see that men, on average, they are older than women when they first get married. And that has been true throughout all this period from 1890 to 2014. But what's interesting to see is that the differential that you should be around uh, four years difference between men and women, now it's only around uh, two years of difference on the average age in at first marriage. So kind of showing that now women, they start to go uh, to um, uh, prioritize education and they also enter, like there is an increase in female labor force participation and then women also delay marriage and they start to catch up and uh, being closer to man in terms of age at first marriage. The second topic about changes 
changes in marital status in the country. In 1950, among people of age 15 and plus, 66% of women were married and only 20% were never married. And we are talking here of people with at least 15 years of age. And 68% of men were married and 20% were never, 28% were never married. And when we compare data from 1950 to 2014, the percentage of those who were married declined. Women declined from 66% to around 50% of women being married and men dropping from 68 to 52. And the percentage of those never married increased for women from 20 to 39 and for men from 28 to 35. So you see that there is a change in marital status, a decline on percentage of people being married, both for men and women, and an increase on those who are never married, both for men and women. And looking specifically on the group uh, between 45 and 54 years of age, so older people, in 1980, 5% of women were never married, only in this more this older group. You just should look at an older group because maybe some of these younger people, they were still going to school, so they're not, not married. So it's just good to make this comparison over time for older people. And then this percentage increases. So in 2010, 14% of women were never married. And by 2030, based on projections by the Pew Research Center, they project that 25% of women are not going to be married by 2030. So a huge increase from only 5% and in 50 years increasing to 25% of women uh, expected to, to not be married by, by that time. So this is just a graph that summarizes that. You see a decline in percentage of women be, uh, with at least 15 years of age of those who are married, an increase on those who are never married, and also an increase in divorce, which becomes more acceptable in, in, the, in the country. So you see increases in divorce in, in the country, and you see a little variation, a little decrease in the percentage of women who are widowed, probably because now men, they tend to live longer, so uh, the, the partners, they, they stay together longer because men don't die uh, so early as they used to, to die in previous, in previous decades. The third topic uh, in terms of these changes that we see in marriage cohabitation it's um, in exactly related to uh, cohabitation patterns before marriage. So this term, whenever we hear the term first, first unions, it relates to both uh, cohabitation and marriage. So whenever you say like, what's the percentage of people who are, are in first union? That includes both people who are formally married or people who are living together in the household, but not, they are not formally married, they are cohabiting. So actually, when you take both of these together, so when you actually analyze the percentage of first unions, and you try to see some changes in more recent years, for example, from 1995 to 2010, the percentage of women aged 15 to 44 not in an union has been actually around 28, kind of stable, based on the National Survey of Family Growth here in the U.S. So this, uh, the percentage of women not in an union is 28%. So that's pretty much the, the, uh, the, the percentage of women not, uh, that have not been in, in a first union, the percentage of women who are not cohabiting and not, uh, not formally married, has been stable within these 15 years. But then, when you look separated by marriage and cohabitation, there are changes of women marrying and cohabiting. The cohabitation increased from 30% in 1995 to 50% in 2006-2010. And the marriage rates, they declined from 39 to 23. 
So the percentage of those not in the union and the overall percentage of those in first unions, which means those uh, who are either cohabiting or marrying, they are, have been stable over time. So it's stable in terms of first unions, it's stable in, st in terms of not, not in an union, but within those in first unions, when we break them down by cohabitation and marriage, we see an increase in cohabitation rates and a decline in marriage rates. Of the 50% of women cohabiting, these ones here, 40% of them transition in, into marriage, 32% remain cohabiting, and 27% of them dissolve their relationships. So most of them, like the highest percentage here is exactly them transition to get married, formally married. Some of them remain cohabiting, and some of them split the relationship. So cohabiting without being married is actually becoming more acceptable in the American society, so it's more acceptable, and then that percentage has been increasing in more recent decades. And we, if we see that in a, in a graph format, in terms of those not in an union, has been kind of stable, as I, I mentioned before. It varied only from 28 in, in 1995 to 27%, and then to 29% between to, uh, 2006 and 2010. So these numbers here, they're kind of stable over time. What changes is the percentage of those cohabiting that increases from 34 to 48 percent, and the uh, the percentage of those marrying decline from 39 to 23 percent. So if you just put this pink line, this pink column here on top of this, and then this middle one on top of this, and then the red one on top of this they would be uh, around the same level as these ones here are in the same level. But when we split those who are in first union by cohabitation and marriage, then you see the trends. That's an interesting thing that we see in the U.S. And, and here we are talking only about women between 15 and 44 years of age in the U.S. in those years, as I mentioned before. So uh, cohabiting uh, through time and just getting uh, the work by many, women age uh, 19 to 44, they have reported cohabiting prior to their first marriage. So what's the percentage of women age 19 to 44 who reported uh, cohabiting prior to their first marriage that they are right now? So only 11% of women reported cohabiting after their first marriage back in 1965 and 74. And that increased to 46, to 59, and to 66 throughout those decades. And now 66% of women, they reported cohabiting before their first marriage, now in 2005, 2010. So cohabitation is the new normal uh, these days. So just looking at the data, exactly these changes over time from 1965 to 2010, the percentage of women uh, between 19 and 44 who cohabited before their first marriage by, by marriage cohort, you see an increase from 11% and then it reached 68% in the, the cohort uh, from 2000 to 2004 and then it declined to 66, but kind of like still much higher than it was in previous years, in previous decades. In terms of cohabitation and education, there are different cohabitation rates by level of education. Usually more educated women, they are less likely to cohabit. Just to give an idea, in 2009-2010, 74% of women with less than a high school degree have ever cohabited. And with those women with a high school degree, 67%. And then it starts to decline even further for women with more education. So women with one to three years of, of college, uh, the cohabitation rates are uh, equal to 57%. And those with four or more years of college, uh, 50%. So it, the, the cohabitation rates, they decline 
as education increases. In a graphical format, we can also see the percentage of women between 19 and 44 who have ever cohabited by level of education. So here we have women with less than 12 years of education, so with like uh, less than high school, women with at least high school, women with one to three years of college, and women with uh, at least four years of college. So within a woman with less than 12 years of schooling, the percentage of those cohabiting increased. And that happened to every, for all women. Also increased for those with high school degree, also increased for those with one to three years of college, and also for those with four or more years of college. But then, when you compare women uh, across the education groups, you see that those with a less education, let's just get the, the blue columns here, they have higher levels of cohabitation than women with more education. And that also happens even in more recent years. Less educated women, they have higher cohabitation rates compared to more educated women, right? So within each education group, cohabitation rates increase. Uh, within each um, year, you see that women, they tend to have lower levels of cohabitation as education increases. And in more recent years, in this paper by 2000, uh, from 2019, uh, talking about cohabitation marital expectations. So this is more related not to the actual uh, cohabitation rates, but uh, they try to investigate whether women think that they will uh, cohabit in, in the future. What are their expectations in relation to cohabitation and, and marriage? So um, what they, they emphasize is that there was a kind of like a stalled second demographic transition. So what was the de second demographic transition? You start to have uh, lower levels of um, people getting married, and you start to have uh, some changes in family composition, and you start to have some, um, the levels of fertility start to decline a lot. And all these changes that happen after you see the first demographic transition in which you saw declines in mortality, declines in, in, in fertility rates, in the second demographic transition, you start to see some some uh, changes in family composition, and you even see even uh, sharper drops in, uh, in fertility. But what, based on this data from 2011 and 2015 from the National Survey of Family Growth in the U.S., you start to see that in, the, in this group of younger women, you know, between 18 and 24 years of age, of single women, they have stronger expectations to marry than to cohabit. That's why these authors, they mention that there is a stalled second, a second demographic transition because now women, they are not, they do not desire so much anymore to cohabit. They start to have actually stronger expectations to marry than to cohabit. So among young women expecting to marry, 68% of them expect to cohabit with their future spouse and 32% expect to marry without cohabiting first. So you actually still have a high proportion of women who still expect to cohabit with their future spouse, and um, only 32% expect to, to marry without uh, cohabiting first. But if you look, um, uh, and, but actually women from disadvantaged backgrounds, they reported the lowest expectations to marry. And just to, to remember, I'm here talking about expectations. It's not actually the rates of cohabitation uh, that we, we talked in the previous slides. And these expectations, they also vary by education. Um, there's no education variation cohabitation expectations, but 
there are marriage expectations. Uh, the marriage expectations, they do vary by education. So what does it mean? Exactly what I mentioned here before. Women from more disadvantaged backgrounds, those with lower education, they report the lowest expectations to marry. But the variations by education uh, are not really significant in terms of co cohabitation expectations. They are more significant in terms of marriage expectations. Um, so we see that, okay, there is a higher percentage of women expecting to cohabit than to marry, but these numbers have not been changing so much among this a young woman based on these more recent years. The fourth topic on, on this uh, lecture, on, on these patterns of marriage uh, and cohabitation changes in the U.S., is related to babies born out of wedlock. Uh, the per, or in other words, the percentage of babies born to unmarried mothers. And the percentage of babies born to unmarried mothers increased from 5% in the 1950s to 41% in 2013. And, um, and actually, uh, in the past, in previous decades, women who had babies out of the marriage, they, it, that was not really accepted by the society. So at that time, you had homes for unwed mothers that would... Um, uh, because those mothers, they would be ejected from their families by their parents because they didn't accept the fact that they were, they were, they had children and they were not married at that time. But these homes for unwed mothers, they reduced in number in, in more recent decades. And this is related to the legalization of abortion. Uh, now contraception is widely available and effective. And you have an increased percentage of single mothers. So actually now mothers, they, they decide to have children even not being married. And like I mentioned, there is a change in society attitudes towards single parenthood. So women, it's more acceptable for women to have children even when they are not married. In terms of race ethnicity and, and the births to unmarried mothers by race ethnicity, we see some variations. So uh, for a non-Hispanic white woman, uh, the 10% of the births were to unmarried mothers back in 1980. But for African-Americans, non-Hispanic African-American women, this percentage was equal to 57% back in 1980s. And among Hispanic women, 24%. And the percentage of births to unmarried mothers increased among all these race ethnicity groups from 10 to 25 in 2013 for a white woman, 57 to 72 for African American woman, and 24 to 53 for Hispanic woman. But you still see that uh, non Hispanic white women have the lowest percentage of births to unmarried mothers, and Hispanics are, Hispanic women are in the middle, and African American women have the highest. Um, percentage of women having births and, and not being formally married. But one interesting thing that we are going to say, it's important to say, is that out of the 72% of women, uh, African-American women who are having babies and they are not uh, married, some of them might be cohabiting. So some of them might have the partner living in, with them in the household, but they are not formally married. And just looking at this data in, in a graph format, you see that the percentage of births to unmarried women, they have been increasing over time. So the total is this black line here. But these percentages are higher for non-Hispanic uh, African-American women, the blue line here, compared to non-Hispanic white, the dark green, and Hispanic women, they are in between in the, in the uh, light green line. So just to, to talk a little bit and kind of like going a little uh, more detail about the unmarried black woman, some reasons why percentages of uh, births to unmarried black mothers are so high than, than, white percent, than the percentages for white women is related to these topics here that I'm going uh, to discuss now. So why the percentage, just going back a little bit on the previous graph, why you have 
so much higher percentage of births to unmarried women among African Americans compared to white. So of the 72% of births to unmarried black women, 30% of the women, they are cohabiting. So just going back to the previous slide, out of the 72% here, 30% of these women are cohabiting. So there is a father helping to raise the child along the mother in the household. And another thing that's discussed in the, in the textbook is actually the availability of black men is low in the country because of the high levels of incarceration that the country has been experiencing in, in these uh, recent decades. So 1.5 million of 8 million black men in the ages of 25 to 54 are not available for the black woman to marry them because they're incarcerated and they also experience a high mortality. Of course, some of them might be married, even being incarcerated, but because of this high level of incarceration, it kind of breaks the families and you start to see families uh, in which women, they live by themselves because of the high incarceration levels and also the, these men are not available to marry other women as well. And that and uh, African-American men also have high levels of mortality compared to other uh, race ethnicity groups. And just in terms of uh, the age of the mother and kind of like how that relates to the births to the unmarried woman, the older the woman, the more likely she has to, uh, he, the more likely she has married. So older women are more likely to, to be married than younger women. The older the woman, the less likely she is not married when she gives birth. So older women are, they are more likely to get to be married, and then they are more likely to be married when they have birth. So the percentage of birth to unmarried woman by age of mother when children are born vary a lot, as we see in this common graph. So the overall birth to unmarried woman, uh, it was like around 40% in 2013. But only if we look only at women under 15 years of age, among this woman here, 99% of the births of this woman, they were of unmarried mothers. They were of unmarried women. So as women get older, they are more likely to be married. So, for example, among the group of, 40, uh, of women between 40 uh, years and over, they only 23.7% of the births are to unmarried women. So within this group, only 24%, around 24% of the births are for, of women who are not married. And the fifth point, on this uh, subtopic of this lecture is related to interracial marriage. So since, and this is data from the Pew Research Center and data that's available in this website here that the, the Pew Research Center makes it public available. And um, so since 1967, there is steadily a steady rise in the intermarriage rates in the US. So it increased from 3% in around 19, the 1980, early 1980s to 10% in 2015. And this is considering all married people. But if we just consider the newlywed people just to capture the information from people in those specific years when they just got married, it increased from 3% in 1967 to 17% in 2015. So what we see, it's an increase in interracial marriage in the US um, between these decades. So people marrying uh, their, pair, uh, their partners uh, of a different race ethnicity group. So you have pretty much a lot of like an increase of um, couples of different uh, race ethnicity groups. And what we see is that there is a, a, demac sorry, a dramatic increase in intermarriage for blacks and whites. So intermarriage rates, 
they vary by race ethnicity. So the highest levels are for Asians and for Hispanics. Hispanics have been stable over time from 26% in 1980 to 27% in 2015. Asians, it declined uh, a little from 33 to 29. But there is a really sharp increase among blacks from 5 to 18 and from whites from 4 to 11. So now 18% of blacks are marrying someone of another race ethnicity group. But those percentages, they remain higher among Asians and among Hispanics, and lowest among whites, but increased from 4 to 11%. And these intermar intermarriage rates, like we are showing in this graph, they vary by race ethnicity, but they also vary by education. Intermarriage uh, rises more for those with at least some college experience. So people who have uh, a bachelor's degree, they have the highest rates of intermarriage, interracial marriage. And so it increased from 7% in 1980 to 19% in 2015. And those with some college also increased, but they are below 18% in 2015. And those with high school or less than high school, they reached only 14% in 2015. So interracial marriage uh, rates, they vary by education and it's higher uh, for people who have higher levels of education. And if we just combine this uh, to information of intermarriage rates by race, ethnicity and education, uh, you see that among blacks and Hispanics, college graduates are more likely to intermarry. So among, among whites, uh, education, high school or less, some college or bachelor's degree doesn't affect much the chances of being intermarried with people of other race ethnicity groups. But among Hispanics, as they improve education, for the, among those who have high school or less, only 16% of them are, uh, have, are married with someone of another race ethnicity group. But that increased to 46% among Hispanics who are um, who have at least a bachelor degree. So these are the percentage of newlyweds in the U.S. age 25 and older who are intermarried. And we also see this variation among blacks, not so pronounced as we saw in Hispanics for when they increase levels of education, but also among blacks. As you increase education, blacks they tend to be have higher chances of being intermarried. And Asians, actually the highest percentage of those who are married with partners with another race ethnicity group are for Asians with at least uh, some college, 39%. And then if we do another combination of intermarriage rates by race, ethnicity and sex, we see that black men are twice as likely as black, black women to intermarriage to intermarry. So if we compare within uh, whites, men and women, the percentage of uh, intermarriage rates do not vary as much from 12 among men and 10% among women. Same thing among Hispanics, 26 and 28. So what we see here that among African Americans, uh, among men, 24% of them are marrying someone else, someone from, from another race ethnicity group. And only 12% among uh, black women. And among Asians, you see the opposite. The percentage is lower among um, Asian men, and the percentage of intermarried is 36% among uh, Asian, um, female Asians, among Asian women. So that's interesting to see that among uh, black men, the percentage is higher than among black women, and Asian men lower than among Asian women. So this data here doesn't let us uh, actually uh, see whether these black men are tending to marry this Asian uh, woman, but uh, some other studies that I, I'm not cited, it's not cited here, they tend to see 
that there is a higher chance of exactly seeing this kind of couples of black men and Asian women. But what's interesting here that I'm highlighting and I'm emphasizing is the differences in intermarriage rates by sex are more pronounced among blacks and among Asians. So this is the topic that I had to uh, emphasize by now on all these family and cohabitation changes that we have been seeing in the U.S. So thank you very much.